Here it goes. So anyway, uh, time goes along, and both my wife and I uh, receive the torch of the family. So I am now the most senior member of my family, and Connie's the last of hers. So most people our age uh, clean through things, move to Dell Webb, and get other people to maintain your house and do everything. So my youngest brother believes that our family has a curse, and that is any horizontal surface uh, that is available gets filled up with stuff. And so with that in mind, in addition to our house full of stuff and my treasures, we inherited my wife's parents' house full of their treasures. So here's a side story. My early days in amateur radio started when I was first dating Connie, my wife. I was invited to her uh, family cabin at Echo Lake, and out on the porch was her father, Bob, W6AMB, silent key, and he had a Swan 350 and a Heathkit 2-meter radio on the porch with an antenna up in the evergreens. And he was talking to other hams all around the, around the world, and I thought that was kind of neat. I can remember my grandmother's old RCA radio listening to shortwave stations, and here he was talking around the world. So Connie and I got married a few years later, and I decided I should get my radio license. Well, so did my mother-in-law. So we decided we'd have a race to see who would get their license first, and to make a long story short, I lost. So that's my father-in-law. And so, of course, like most every new ham, uh, the first radio I purchased was a handheld, and it wasn't really a good way to talk around the world. So at our first house, I bought a Hustler five-band trap vertical and put it up uh, with a TS-120 uh, Kenwood radio. We moved to this house, and the five-band trap vertical moved with me. I put up a Mosley TA-33 and then put the Wark band uh, extension on it. So anyway, back to the story. So what do you do with your wife's grand piano uh, that she learned to play with in high school? My upright piano and Connie's other grand piano when you're thinking of moving to Del Webb. Well, the thing is, you don't move to Del Webb. You uh, go and look for a bigger house. So the requirements for the new house were three things. Uh, had to have a place to put cars, which is my other hobby. Um, can't have stairs because my knees are shot. And you can't have HOAs or CCNRs because I wanted to put up a tower. So we looked and looked for a house. We found the house that we eventually bought. We looked at each other and said, well, is this good enough? Should we keep looking? We decided it was good enough, so we bought the house. So anyway, this is supposed to be a presentation about station installation, but you got to think of a couple more things first before we get to there. Now, you're going to find things in here that has to do with Murphy's Law. Well, the house we bought was uh, from the Murphys, and I think their karma stayed in the house as they left. So Murphy's Law is that uh, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So... Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, so let's see. When we moved into the new house, the building permits for the carport and the shop were never signed off. So when we moved there, suffice it to say, we were supposed to plan on moving all the things into the shop, getting things organized and all that kind of stuff, but it didn't happen because they hadn't gotten the building permits. So we moved into the house without the building permits completed, and Placer County made us do all sorts of fancy, crazy things like put in new walls and everything, so that was kind of a mess. But anyway, uh, everything was in boxes, and like right now we're still finding things uh, in boxes, like my backup FT100 um, kind of came out in a box. So anyway, back to the antenna story. I keep going away. 
Uh, the grand plan was to have two towers, a tall one for HF and a short one for VHF and UHF. Uh, the towers were supposed to be out of line of sight uh, from the kitchen window because my wife didn't want to look at a neighbor's wall. She wanted to look out at a view. And so uh, we drew the plans and all that kind of stuff. So I went to Pacific on that year and I bought a step IR antenna, DB18E. Now I already had uh, up in the attic of the old house a uh, 440 and a 220 ham pro antenna and they should be easy to remove because I put them up 25 years earlier. But uh, I forgot I put insulation up in the attic and I was 25 years older. So anyway, it took a while to get the antennas out of the attic of the old house. Right before we moved, a big old gust of wind came and broke the mount for my two meter beam. And so I've got all sorts of aluminum pieces that I may bring to the River Sea Arks, you know, October white elephant sale or something like that. Anyway, they're just sitting around the house. So here I am, antennas in hand, rigs boxed up, including my FT-100, and ready to go. So I contacted Tashing Towers, and they're sort of local. They're down just in Visalia area. And I could drive past Fresno and pick the thing up. Don't have to pay for shipping, and I'd support the uh, local economy. So... Um, what the heck, after a few months they told me it was ready. So, uh, of course, it wasn't ready. The galvanizing people took Thanksgiving off and then they took Christmas off. And so finally the thing was complete. So I drove down all the way down to the valley and went to pick up the tower. Well, it was big. So I picked up the base part of it that goes into the ground and brought it home. So, <coughs> next, off to Auburn, I live in Placer County. It took about a day, and it was, it was actually not too bad. Um, I went to the first person, and they said, yeah, this is okay. And he looked at my drawings and all that kind of stuff, and he said, well, go talk to environmental health. So I went and talked to environmental health, and they looked at my drawings and made sure I wasn't putting a tower on top of a septic tank. And so they signed off on it. And I went back to the first guy and he said, where are you putting it? And I said, well, here's the fence line. I'm putting it 15 feet in. And he said, has to be 30 feet in. I said, oh, crud. My wife didn't want to look at the tower. So I said, okay. So I called Connie up. She says, eh, it's okay. Anyway, so I go back. The guy says, okay, I'll move it over another 15 feet. What do I do? He hands me a bottle of whiteout and says, move it over 15 feet. And I went, wow, that's really nice. A county person that just lets you do it and even you know, handed me the whiteout. So anyway, so uh, I whited it out. And I went to the next person. <coughs> and he checked the paperwork and all that. And then he said, well, how am I going to know the rebar that you're using to put it in the ground is the correct size? And I said, well, I bought the thing. Here's the engineering plans. It's already made. Well, almost already made. So he says, that's good. So he finally signs everything off, sends me to the big guy at the end. And he walks up to him and says, do you have any problems with this tower? And the guy looks at him and says, I don't like towers. So I'd been there all day, right up in Auburn. And so I looked at the guy and I said, do you have any legal problems with my tower? And he kind of says, well, no. So that was good. And so he handed it to the other guy and he signs it off and hands me this big pile of papers and says, go pay the lady. So I paid for my building permit, got the building permit. That's a good thing. And if I have a little bit of time at the very end, I'll tell you an interesting story about that. So anyway, I told you we had this, uh, this uh, contraption that was already built. Fortunately, it's nice to have friends. Uh, Jason Lager, who's back there, um, uh, KF6QXX, made the long trek to my house and helped me wire all the rebar pieces together. And the plans that Tashian Tower 
uh, provided. Uh, Jason could understand them, and I don't know how he did. It was, uh, they were a little rudimentary. So now I have to dig a hole. Well, this is the first lucky part of the whole thing. The neighbor next door was putting in a horse barn, and they had a cement crew. And so I walked over there and talked to the foreman and said, yeah, can you dig a hole? He says, sure. So I thought, well, that's good. All I have to do is pay him. So uh, he shows up with his backhoe and starts to dig a hole. Well, it's supposed to be four by four feet by seven feet deep. At one foot down, he hits Lincoln Clay. Now, Lincoln Clay is wonderful stuff. It's what Gladding McBean has been using for years to make sewer pipes and Franciscan china and all that kind of stuff. It's really tough. He's digging and the tines of the backhoe just go scooting across the clay and don't dig. As you can see, it's kind of up in the air. So anyway, <sighs> Murphy again, we need better tines. Okay, so I called rental places. Do you rent buckets with sharper tines? Of course not. They don't do that. So I looked on the side of the, the tractor that was the previous picture, and there was the name of the company that services it. So I called them up and they said, oh, I have to do is replace the tines with these pointed ones, and it'll go through anything. I said, ah, great. Do you have some? They said, yep. And so I drove all the way to West Sacramento, they had new tines and suggested that I purchase the pins that put the tines into the bucket because, you know, the old pins probably been there a long time. So um, the problem is the old pins didn't come out, so we had to use a sledgehammer and a couple pieces of rebar and beat the crud out of the thing. And we finally got the new tines on, and he dug down until he reached the end of the limit on his... Uh, backhoe and then the workers got in and with a jackhammer and buckets and ropes and all that kind of stuff got down far enough so that the job would be finished. So we built a fixture to hold and level the rebar cage uh, that Jason had, had nicely wired back together and we nailed the fixture down and we're ready for the next inspection. So the workers assured me that this fixture was perfectly level. Well, I got my bubble level out. You know, it's one of these like three foot long bubble levels. And it didn't agree. It wasn't right. And the way you can tell if you're buying a bubble level, if your bubble level is good, is you put it on a table and you pay attention to where the bubble is and then you just turn it around and the bubble should be in the same place. Easy way to see if they've made it right. <laughs> see? Pretty good, huh? Anyway, we, uh, we hemmed and hawed and adjusted and beat and all that kind of stuff. We finally agreed on the final placement. We <coughs> crossed my fingers. <coughs> I called the county, scheduled another inspection. Building inspector showed up on time and he looked at the progress. After he looks down in the hole, he said, boy, it's a good thing you called and hadn't poured concrete because I didn't see how deep that hole was. So he signed that off. The cement truck came like the next day and they started pouring concrete and they put in five yards or so of concrete and then it was time to let it cure. Cure it. Now, when you look at that, you hope the thing's level because that's what holds the tower up. So anyway, now it's time for the final inspection. That's the tilt over fixture. The building inspector shows up and he looks everything over and he says, I can't sign off on that. I said, how come? He said, there's no electrical grounds installed. And I said, there's no electrical grounds on the building permit. He says, I don't care. I'm not going to sign it off without a grounding permit. Okay, so Jason to the rescue. He's got an electric jackhammer. 
Now, it took Jason 30 minutes to get the first ground rod in. Okay? And that's with like a lot of work. I talked him into putting in seven. Okay? I, I, I really wouldn't blame him if he never answered a phone call from me again. Anyway, the inspector came and signed it off. Okay, I called Tashin Towers. Remember, I only took half of it with me. I called them up. They'd sold my rest of the tower to somebody else. But they'll make me a new one. Okay. So, what I didn't know was dear old Tashin Towers had made this really gigantic contract with the United States Air Force. And they were building these really huge, huge, huge trailers towed by, you know, semi-trucks with this gigantic tower that lifts up and hydraulics and the antenna goes up and the feet come down and all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, he made like seven of those things and it saved the business, but it didn't save me. So anyway, he said he'd have it done. So we went through the galvanizing thing at Thanksgiving and Christmas again. It's the next year, right? Okay, another year. So, the tower's almost done, and I'm headed to the DX convention in Visalia. So, I'll pick the tower up and bring it home. So, I borrow my brother's car hauling trailer. We have old cars, and he has a nice trailer. And so, I tool down and go into Tash and Towers. But I'd forgotten something. I was on my way to Visalia. And I looked at my email. I couldn't tool down. Because on my email, just as I was leaving, sorry Bob, the tower's not done. So I go down to Visalia anyway. And I stop by. And here's my tower in pieces. And it's laying there. And... I say, okay, I'll get it in a couple of weeks. So they call me up, it's ready. So we get back with the truck and the trailer and drive down to, down to Tash and Towers. And it's on this great big gantry, nice big building, a big gantry across the ceiling. And the guy pushes the electric winch and it comes down. Well, the motor unit and the bottom of the tower have to hang off the back of the trailer because you can't put the whole tower on the motor. So it's hanging off the trailer. And when it hits the trailer, the trailer and the truck go, eh. And so there's too much weight on the back of the trailer, and there's no way we're driving back to Sacramento area with a trailer like that. So what do you do? Yeah, that, yeah, that would work. But anyway, they said, ah, we'll deliver it. I said, how much? He said, 200 bucks. I said, well, that's fine. Go for it. So the tower and the trailer show up in my backyard. Now, I don't have a crane, so how do you get this stupid thing off the trailer? Well, he tilts the trailer up, and the ta trailer stays tilted up, and the tower stays on the trailer, so it didn't want to slide off. So how do you get the silly thing off? Well, the guy that delivered it also built the trailer and the tower, so he knew how the things would work, but he didn't have any tools. So he'd put the trailer together with Torx bolts. So fortunately, I had the right kind of wrenches and all that kind of stuff. And was able to take the thing apart. So how do you get it off of the trailer? Well, we got a come along. And we tied the end of the tower to that base, the, the base I showed you. And then we disconnected the trailer from the truck. And got a sledgehammer and hit the support in the front of the trailer while you pulled on the come along and drove the trailer out from underneath the tower. Now, we bolted the tower on, and as I said, and then and beat the thing down. But as you notice, we didn't put it on the bottom bolts. We put it up there a little bit higher. So fortunately, we remembered to lower it down to the correct bolts 
before we got kind of got it off the, completely off the trailer. So anyway, up it goes. It's nice to have the tilt-over feature so that you can raise the tower. I think I will never tilt it over because the antenna is too big. Once you tilt it over, the antenna is going to hit the ground. So anyway, we cranked up the tower. And it went up and it looked straight. So we got an extension cord, ran it all the way out the tower, pushed up, and it went up. And guess what? It was straight. The delivery guy left. Now, to get all the coax and the control lines to the tower from the house, we had to dig a trench. So here's the path of the, the wiring. Starts in the shack, goes up a pipe, into the roof, across the roof, through a hole in the side of the house, hangs from a messenger line that we didn't have hooked up yet, so it's like hanging on the ground, over across the yard, into my goat barn that I don't have any goats in, out of the goat barn, into a trench, and over to the antenna. So the backhoe guy comes, and the problem was that I had to work that day. So I kind of told him, go there, and told my wife where to, where to tell him to dig the hole, and I went away to work. Well, I came home, and believe it or not, my wife has way more luck than I do because the trench was exactly where it belonged, and the one piece of PVC water pipe that was there, he just kind of dug underneath it, and I didn't know exactly where it was, but he was a good backhoe guy and could find it. So in goes the PVC pipe. So we've got pipe for coax and pipe for uh, 120 volt electricity and uh, pipe for control lines and everything's cool. Then the rain started. Now, you know the 2016 rains. So uh, Mark Finan and the gang said, it's going to rain. So I said, I better do something. So I got some small pieces of rebar, and I drove them in with a sledgehammer. I didn't have Jason. And then I, I wired it. I have baling wire. I have Fords, right? So I baling wired the, the thing together and tied the, tied the PVC pipe down. Well, the rains didn't stop. And I discovered that when PVC pipe is covered with two and a half feet of water, that it floats and pulls the rebar out of the ground. Okay, so off to Harbor Freight to get a sump pump. They're sold out. Funny thing, huh? I finally found one and pumped all the water out between the storms. And I shoveled a whole bunch of wet dirt into the trench to hold down the pipes, hoping they stay down. And they did. So now we have coax lines running out of the top of the house and then just kind of down on the ground and going kind of along the ground because it hasn't hooked up the messenger line yet. So anyway, there it is. Now, the rains of 2016 and 17 ended finally, and we could do some work outside. So my uh, next door neighbor's uh, electrician too. So while it was raining, I had uh, 240 and 120 run into the shack and I moved my desk across so that we could do all the work on the uh, work and, and, and get, to the, get to the coax connectors and plug it into the gear. So, now here's a, a slight diversion from the story. Okay, I'm a volunteer at the Emergency Communication Center at Mayfair VA Hospital. And the Chief Engineer and Station Trustee, Don, W6PJJ, took an interest in my project and volunteered to help. Well, Don's philosophy was that everything should be done correctly and with proper engineering practices. This is kind of like unheard of at my house. But anyway, doing things uh, correctly turned out to make, make the project take a little longer, but it really was a, a good thing. So in the building process, uh, he made many, 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 many visits to my QTH 
and provided assistance and help. Okay, guess what? I went into my shack. Remember I have all the stuff pulled out of the way? And discovered white pieces of paper all over the floor. Well, it wasn't white pieces of paper. It was sheetrock. Because in the wonderful weather that we had, my roof leaked. And the sheetrock in the shack destroyed itself, fell to the floor, and it must have been Mrs. Murphy because the damage was located where the desk wasn't and my radio gear didn't get splatted. So anyway, we had the ceiling and the roof leak fixed and uh, just to let you know, I still haven't painted the ceiling. So anyway, rain, 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 more rain, more rain, more rain. It helped the drought, almost broke Oroville Dam, and uh, anyway, with, because of the mud, no heavy equipment could be uh, in the backyard. So it's time to wait for spring. Well, it finally stopped raining. Don, uh, W6PJJ, uh, kind of enthusiastically, <coughs> well, maybe not, climbed the tower and attached a yard arm. Uh, still no antenna but we put up an 80 meter inverted V and uh, it looks like that. So um, we now have a tower installed and there's the inside of my room. Coax in the shack, gear spread here and there all over the house and the shop and after three years of being off the air except for you know, like QRP in camping and my mobile radio in the car I'm getting tired of all of this stuff. So I needed to operate. So what the heck, I'm sorry, the desk's on the wrong side of the room and all that kind of stuff. So we just hooked it up and the desk is up against my workbench so I don't have any tools or any coax connectors or anything like that. So I unpacked some of the things that I had and searched for things I didn't and it was kind of like beg, borrow, and steal or purchase those things that you needed. So back in the shack we hooked everything up and we hooked the 80 meter antenna to the tuner and turned the power on. Well, good old Murphy must have been on vacation because the gear came to life and there were readable signals on uh, 80, 40, and 20 and I've got Elecraft gear and Elecraft tuners will like tune anything. So it was, it was time, to, time to operate. And uh, so we uh, had the inverted V hooked up. And so now we're going to run the tower to the top and make sure it's actually a V instead of kind of like a, a dipole. So we plugged in the motor, big long, uh, a short extension cord right to the power that uh, Jason hooked up. Uh, we plugged in the motor and pushed up. The motor churned about one quarter of a revolution and the GFI went stupid GFI. So we reset the thing. Uh-oh. Murphy got in that damn thing. That's not mine. Damn Murphy. Did you pull one of those on there? No. How do you get out of this thing? Push the little thingy on the top. There. All right. Okay, because that's some good stuff here. So anyway, we, we the GFI popped, and uh, oh fooey. So we got a big, giant, long extension cord and ran it to the next plug and pushed the up button, and its GFI went pop. So what the heck? Cutting to the chase. After much checking, prodding, and pondering we discovered that the waterproof motor that says sheds water like a duck was full of water. <laughs> so anyway, it's time for Visalia again. So the tower people were there and they promised to send me a new motor on the following Tuesday. Wonderful. A week later, they called me up. Said, uh, we don't have your address. I did not have my address. You checked my took my check, you don't know, anyway. So I gave my address again, and another week later the motor showed up. So 
hooking it all up, many bolts, support brackets, all that kind of stuff, you know, you have to rebuild the tower. It was, it was all reinstalled. We pushed up and it went up. Now, you can see the tower from the road. My next door neighbor, as I drove by, said, I see your antenna. And I said, well, <laughs> if you think you can see it now, wait till we put an antenna on the tower. So anyway, um, my, my youngest son came to visit us for Mother's Day, and he was nice enough to climb up a really tall ladder. And remember those, those pieces of coax that was running across the backyard? Well, he hung them from the messenger line standing on this really tall ladder. And uh, so now I don't have to worry about tripping on them, running over it with a lawnmower, or anything like that. My wife's happier too. So now here comes the really fun part. Okay, now time's passed along. This time I planned ahead. I figured that a completed antenna would probably be at least as heavy as all the parts in all the shipping boxes. Well, pretty smart, huh? I figured it'd be best if we constructed the antenna right at the base of the tower rather than in my driveway and then carrying everything to the tower. Now, even better planning was putting down plastic tarps to catch all the dropped parts. Now, I figured I'd have a fighting chance of finding all of them, and it turned out to be a good idea because so far I can't find an aluminum or a stainless steel magnet anywhere. So, here comes the first step. Read the manual. Okay, I did. The manual for a uh, step IR DB18E is 79 pages long and they said the first step is construct the boom. So Don and I pushed the first sections together and bolted it. Perfect. We got the second section. We pushed it together and it got stuck halfway in. Okay, it's stuck. So like more expletives deleted so we got these great big pliers and liberal applications of WD-40 and pipe wrenches and hammers and separated the parts. Then we sanded down and dressed the pipe with sandpaper and after lots more WD-40, we had the second section connected and bolted together. Uh, that, that dressing down and stuff wasn't in the manual. So that was end of day one of the antenna. The next step went, steps went as designed. The mast mounting plate was installed and lined up square, and the step, step motor wiring for the three units was finished. And that took most of day two, and it was 97 degrees out, so we quit. <coughs> day three. Fortunately, it's not 97, but it's windy. And it's time to mount the motor plates and make sure they're perpendicular to the mast plate. You mount the motor housings on the plate, and we did everything as prescribed. Everything was perfectly aligned. Oh no, here's Murphy again. We discovered we'd mounted the driven element plate backwards. Oops. So we had to take all that part apart, turn it around, bolt it back up, and all that kind of stuff. So then you attach the coax switch box and coax. And Don thought, <coughs> that's kind of a crummy picture. Don thought that it would be a good idea to uh, protect the coax. And so we've got some plastic tubing. We were thinking of using garden hose, but we used plastic tubing and protected it against all the sharp edges. And so everything kind of worked good, and we called it a day. So it's now day four, and everything's going real well, and it's time to perform tests. So we started all our wiring at the tower and took them to the shack. And it was, you know, I measured to where the radio would be, and I was going to cut it off. And I said, wait a minute, the wiring has to go up the tower too. Because the rotor's up there, and the antenna's up there. You can't just stop at the base. So I said, did I measure it right, or didn't I measure it right? I couldn't remember. So I took up all the slack that I could and cut the wire off, inside and took it out and hoped it would go up the tower when the tower was all the way up. Well, anyway, what the heck. 
So we took all the, the equipment back out to the tower and I was inside the shack with the radio. My wife Connie and Don were outside and you're supposed to test the Step IR uh, little copper, beryllium copper pieces that go inside and out to make sure everything works. So they listened and the wiring was okay. That was good. So anyway, now here's the poles. They need to be snapped together. They're kind of like fishing poles, you know, that lock. So we snapped them together and hooked each section in place and you secure it with heat shrink tubing and so that was enough, good for the next day. So uh, anyway, um, it was supposed to rain the next day so we postponed it a couple of them. Okay, so then we continued to work on stuff and that's the tube that's at the end of the antenna. It's called a sweep tube and uh, we swept away the rain puddles and um, Mrs. Murphy kind of showed up. She noticed the heat shrink tubing we'd put on had kind of slid. So just to protect it, we had some of that uh, rescue tape that they sell at, at you know, Pacific On and all that place. And we used it and we put some rescue tape on just to be sure. And then to build those things, you put um, electrical tape on it, like 10 wraps of electrical tape. And that serves as a stop and a guide, and then you put on um, some silicone tape and then some 3M grip tape that's like skater's tape and pushed all the parts together and you put the sweeps together with the tubes and uh, spreader bars and it's all cool. So there's Don and I, we're attaching the telescoping poles to the sweeps, uh, it worked better than expected, now uh, we have what looks like a series of elements all ready to go. They're all laying on the ground. So now here we're on uh, day eight. And since the telescoping poles um, change diameters, Step IR provides you with an inner guide tube. You put these inner guide tubes in, which is basically a 7 8 inch PVC pipe and a cone. You slide them together and you glue it all together. Well, Step IR provides you everything you need except for tools. So here was this nice little glass bottle of PVC cement and some little uh, Q-tips that you were supposed to use. Well, you open the bottle up, and of course, uh, Mrs. Murphy was there. In the years since purchasing the antenna, the glue doll dried out, and it had like the consistency of silly putty. And so we looked at it and said, yeah, it looks just like PVC pipe, so we'll just use regular old PVC glue. And so we did, and it worked just fine. So we went to lunch and uh, let the glue dry and then decided it wasn't worth it, so we quit. Uh-oh. Um, before Don came back over, I went and looked at our work, and here was Murphy again. Um, we'd hung the coil of control wire on the boom just to keep it out of the mud. And when we put the elements on the boom, we never took the control wire off the, uh, off the boom. And of course, it required unspooling it. As you can see, there's the wire inside the elements. And uh, so we had to disconnect the control cable wire from the controller and unwind it and put the little screws back on, hook all the wires back up. So anyway, Murphy was smiling. So now it's all finished and it's sitting there on sawhorses. Okay, here we go. We test the rotor. Fortunately, Don and I believe in checking and double checking. <coughs> Don believes it more than I do. Uh, we prefer to blame things on the Murphys. We put the rotor and the controller in the garage because it was shady and we tested it. So we set down the rotor and we set the controller next, controller next to it and like they say, it's better to make sure it's right when it's down on the ground rather than up on the top of the tower. So we hooked things up, checked the colors on the controller, and we pushed counterclockwise. And the rotor went counterclockwise. Push clockwise. It went clockwise. Push counterclockwise. It went counterclockwise a little bit and stopped the controller had an error message on it. 
I blame Don. Didn't work. So anyway, here we go. I called Green Heron. They're the people that manufactured the controller. And after some technical help, you know, push this, do that, hold this down for a while, it moved and then quit again. So the tech said, uh, it only happened on a few modules and that was a year ago. I said, well, <laughs> it's been in the garage for about a year, so this one must be bad. So we sent it off to New York. So it went by way of UPS and it's uh, supposed to be done. Now, remember everything I measured at the beginning? Well, I forgot that you don't want rigid coax, like, you know, LMR 400 or anything like that, all the way up at the top because the rotor has to move around. You want some kind of coax that's flexible. Well, I had plenty of, plenty of good rigid coax, but I didn't buy the other stuff. So I looked through my stuff, and of course there isn't enough coax on the roll, so I called up DX Engineering. Hi, send me a spool of coax. Oh boy. So hopefully the coax and the rotor show up at the same time. Well, testing the rotor again. It, it showed up from New York. This time we did it on the porch because it was afternoon shade, or morning shade, excuse me, and everything worked. We centered the rotor at the midpoint, disconnected everything, and Don climbed the tower even less enthusiastically. And he bolted in the thrust bearing and then hoisted the rotor plate, we hoisted the rotor plate up to him. After many expletives, it fit where it belonged. Then I hoisted in the rotor. And we pulled it up to the top and more expletives because it wouldn't fit through the legs of the tower. So after a whole heck of a lot more expletives, Don got it actually to fit through there and he tightened everything up and quit, leaving it in place for the next job. And so there's Don up there um, having fun putting things up. So he has the rest of the rotor parts and installed them. I sent up a short piece of pipe and Don made sure the alignment was right and it all checked out. And we brought the rotor controller to the base of the tower and make sure it turned while it was up there. And it turned. Okay, the step IR manual says, <coughs> excuse me, check all fasteners on the antenna to be certain they are tight. It says, now this may seem redundant, but the time to discover a loose fastener is now, not when that part it was supposed to hold falls out of the sky. I checked, and sure enough, I'd forgotten to tighten one of the hose clamps on the telescoping poles. Whew. So we got that. Now it was time to see if everything worked. So Don and my wife were out at the step IR controller that's still on sawhorses, and I was in the shack, and Don had a handheld radio, and I had a radio, and we were talking back and forth, and we pushed buttons, and they listened, and everything worked well. So, yippee! So, now it's time to attach the lines and the antenna. So this time, Don didn't have to climb the tower. I had a friend of mine that volunteered to come over, and he has a bucket lift. I called him out, and he says, oh, well, it's not a bucket lift, it's a pole lift. So, okay, yeah, he works for a company that puts telephone poles in, and it grips the pole and sticks it in the hole. So I didn't think they wanted to grip Don and send him up to the top. So um, I, I looked all over the place, and we called all sorts of stores and finally found a bucket lift and a rental company that had one. And so I scheduled a Friday at 7 o'clock morning pickup since I had to work later that day. So at 7 o'clock in the morning I drove over there and Murphy was at the counter. He said, well, I knew you wanted it for the weekend and you didn't need it now, so I rented the lift to someone else. They'll be back at noon. <laughs> I can't be back at noon. I have to work. So I called my brother up. So my brother's displaying his old cars at the state fair. And so he jumps in another car and comes over, gets my truck, and goes and gets the lift. Now, the rental place told me it was a four-wheel lift that you could drive around and 
do all the sorts of work. So when I got home, I discovered it's a lift with only wheels to tow it and outriggers that puts it in one place. I called Don up. Don said, it's not going to work. You need to be able to get around it. So um, next day, it was time to see if it would work. So here it is, and we're trying to attach an antenna to a bucket, and so we've got like towels, towels here on the, the cage, and ties onto it, and the pole running down here, and my son and my brother and me and Don and everybody um, trying to make it work. So anyway, uh, with towels zip tied to the lift and padding and all that kind of stuff, uh, Don and my son Mark went airborne. And without going to too many details um, of the three hours of painstaking working using hydraulic jacks and broken bolts and this is that and the other thing, three hours later, he got it hooked up. So remember day four when we didn't know if the control line was long enough? Well, we brought it in there in the control line and hooked it up and it was just fine. So anyway, uh, it was time to clean up and that's kind of how it looked, but that was kind of near the beginning. That's all the stuff. So it was time to clean everything up and the antenna is up there and we put a flag up there. I have a lot of, lot of stuff. Anyway, so um, my, uh, we got a couple more seconds. Yeah, maybe. Uh, my desk needs to move back. The antenna looks much smaller up in the sky. And so here's the, here's the fun aside story. I'm sitting at home. Nobody comes to my house. I'm at the end of a long driveway and I'm out in the boonies. Go answer the door. Here's this guy. Hi. Is that your tower? Yeah. He says, I like your flag. I said, well, thank you very much. You know, I'm, I'm planning on putting it up on Veterans Day and all the, the national holidays. I like your flag. And he says, you know, my next door neighbor put up a tower. They were going to put uh, like some cell antennas on it or something like that. But you know, he didn't have a building permit. Do you have a building permit? <laughs> I, uh, I said, yes. As a matter of fact, I do. I said, Placer County's been out here three times and inspected it. And everything's built well. The grounding's all done. The antenna's all pre-manufactured and I have all the engineering specs and everything's good. And he said, oh, well, I like your flag. And I said, well, thank you very much. So now, I think it's time for tower lights. Um, that, that plane is actually behind my tower. And there it is uh, in the middle of the night. So yeah, it's an ag cat. So we put up some tower lights. And uh, I don't know if you can see it. It kind of looks like that with the tower and that, with, that without the tower at night. Um, you can see it for about oh, two miles. So anyway, uh, there it is in my backyard. And I always wanted to do that. Don uh, kept complaining, how come you want to put all these pulleys up? It's extra work. It's this, that, that. But that, it looks cute. So anyway... Um, yeah, you were not the tower. Yeah, I, I, well, that's why I'm giving the presentation. Um, anyway, um, so I want to thank uh, my wife and Don and Jason, my son Mark, my son John, my other son Luke, and the funding is by my quartet. And uh, here's my final comment. I really wonder what would happen if Connie's dad collected stamps. <laughs> so anyway, um, that's it. So, uh, any questions about how you uh, want to uh, put up an antenna without going crazy? Okay. Yes. Oh, thank you. It is uh, the the tower is a seventy five foot tower. 
with a, what's on the top? About eight feet, of, eight feet of stinger on the top, six feet. Yeah, eight foot. Yeah, so it's 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 up there. It's got room to improve. I mean, to add to it. Big. Yes. So what's your DXCC score? I don't know yet. Oh, what did I, what did I say? Oh, the very first day. The very first day I worked in Alaska, Colorado, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida. Um, I've worked um, Australia, New Zealand, <coughs> South America, um, Europe. Winter field day. And Don came over and we did winter field day and worked real well. It was like working at a DX station. Um, I had probably 150 stations in an hour. Yeah. I had to write them down. There, there are lots. There are lots better antennas, lots bigger antennas. Step IR makes two of them that are bigger than mine, um, but it works real well, especially compared to my old TA33. And the noise floor out at my house is really, really low. It's really nice. I'm really fortunate. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you forgot to mention. Oh, <laughs> yes. O'Brien's law says that Murphy was the populist. Yes, well, yeah. Um, dear, old, dear old Murphy uh, did show up quite often. It was, it was really kind of a trial. And I, I, again, really want to thank Don and Jason, especially Don, for you know, doing the engineering work and climbing towers. Um, I've got a really shot right knee, and so I couldn't have done it. And, you know, old people on towers is probably not the world's best thing anyway, but we survived, and it's up. It hasn't blown down. Uh, the rotor goes round and round, and the electrons go out into the ether. So I'm real happy. Yes? Uh, how uh, high was the, you said you had two meters. You were two meters? Um, Your antenna? This is, the antenna is... This one is a 40 through 6, oh. and there's an 80 meter uh, inverted V that's attached to the yard arm that was the very first thing we put up. Oh. Uh, I bought uh, what the... What was your 6 uh, meter game? Uh, it's not. It's, it's uh, a 6 meter dipole. Oh, it's dipole. it's uh, yeah two, two pieces of aluminum. Pretty I don't know if you can see this. Uh, the oops, wrong you can see it there. Yeah. The the six meter. Where's the yellow the little button? The six meter is right there. It's just a, a aluminum dipole. It's just in there. Um, well, it has a counterpoison behind it, so. Yeah, the 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 um, back the the reflector behind it acts as a reflector only slightly. So it's, it's not real directional. Um, I bought uh, a TA, what was it? Triax 33 foot tower from the club. It was uh, un, unused for years and uh, we put it up and it has a, a two meter vertical, a two meter horizontal antenna a uh, 220 vertical antenna and a 440 vertical beam on the smaller tower. And it's, it's now operational. That's my station at home. Yes, Carol? Yeah, question. Uh, the, uh, what's, what's the power capacity of this antenna? Uh, it, it, in legal limit. It'll handle 1,500 yeah. watts. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, uh, and what is what was the transmitter and the station that equipment you were using with this? Uh, I have a, a older Elecraft K3. It's not the K3S model, but I have a Elecraft K3, the Elecraft Pan Adapter, uh, the a KPA 500, and a KAT antenna tuner uh, as my as my station. So you're running it just at 500 watts then? Most all the time I run it at 100 or less. You know, PSK is 25 watts, and uh, most of the time I try to run it at 100 watts or less and don't use the amplifier. Is this the antenna that you use to check into our 10 meter net? Yes. 
<coughs> Thank you. I also discovered that it helps when it's pointed south. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, Jason. So how much does this whole thing cost? Uh oh. <laughs> you know, you know. Here's here's the answer. I don't know. Um, I uh, when I was doing planning this presentation, I was going to sit down and add it up, but I, I think I scared myself. Um, and the final slide was I was going to pick a model of a car that equated to the cost of the project. And it would be, I can at least tell you, it would be a new car. Okay, and I, I, don't, know, I don't know whether it's a, a, a little tiny Skyon or however Toyota pronounces that, or you know, up in the Lexus Era, era, but it's somewhere in there. Now I kept I kept all the receipts, and I've got a stack of them about this much from Home Depot because every day I'd make like two trips to Home Depot because you needed clamps and you needed brackets and you needed more bolts and you needed this and that and the other thing. Ice cream. I didn't even get ice cream. And, and, you know, so I've got a stack of Home Depot receipts about this tall. And then there's like the seven or eight orders from DX Engineering for everything from coax to um, amphenol connectors and all that. The problem that I have is that my old radio, I put up over 30 years. And so you didn't add up the cost. You know, you just kind of go to the parts drawer. And here's a PL259. And, you go to another drawer and here's some electrician's tape and all that kind of stuff. I had to buy it all for this one. Oh, Home Depot loves me. And so I got those and DX Engineering and Green Heron for the controller and M2 for the rotor and Tash and Towers for the tower and Step IR for the antenna. And that doesn't count the gear, but I've had the gear for a little while. So... I want to thank the Camellia String Quartet and my uh, golden parachute that my district gave me to get rid of me, and uh, that, and my wife, and that paid for that stuff. So anyway, any other thing? Yeah. I may be asking a silly question. The lines that are coming down. Oh, the lines that are coming down. That's what holds Christmas lights. Ah. Oh. They're just it's just just Dacron line. It's a it's a freestanding tower. Do you take any precautions in case of storms? Do you lower it? Or well, that's a good question. According to the literature, it's supposed to be able to handle any of the winds that could come through Placer County unless there's a you know hurricane or something like that. Um, so the only thing I've done is when there's lightning, um, you can retract the elements completely into the control housing and supposedly it creates less of an attractive force rather than having all that metal out there. And the tower has uh, lightning protection on it. Uh, all the control lines have lightning protection. Uh, and so if the TV says, oh, we're going to have horrible lightning storm tomorrow, I'll pull the coax out of the back of the rigs, but if it's starting to have lightning and I've forgotten to pull it out, I'm not going to touch the thing. You know, it's time to time to call ARRL and buy ARRL insurance, which I think I'm going to do. Anyway, so there's my tower. Um, it's been fun and uh, it works just fine. So, um, how strong are the winds where you're at? Strong. Where it's flat out there. So, um, I don't know, 40, it's just like yours, probably. If, yeah, if you, if you know where the Thunder Valley Indian Casino is and the Placer County landfill, I'm about two miles to, to the west of the landfill and about, what's that, that make it two and three quarters miles or something to the west of uh, the Indian Casino. 
So we're out in the kind of flatlands. So you're out in the boondocks. I'm out in the boondocks. Uh, it, it's about eight or nine miles to get groceries or gasoline or anything like that from my house to anywhere. Now the developments are coming in, and fortunately all of the new developments and everything are having to put all their utilities underground. Stay down, noise floor. Anyway, so there it is. So thank you very much, and uh, hope it was interesting.